Right, OK, yeah, I thought I'd just put the clip up. For those who were perhaps hoping to see a film for 45 minutes, I just thought I'd say that I'm not going to talk about that matrix. I'm going to talk about the archaeological matrix. Um, obviously, I'm here as Keith May. I have this thing called an AHRC Leadership Fellowship at the moment, so I'm, I'm presenting result or current work on this project called the full title is up there, The Matrix Connecting and Reusing Digital Records and Archives of Archaeological Investigations. There is a link to a website, which if anyone really wants to go and look at, there's a lot more of this stuff that you can go, and there is some live stuff. I'm going to show some screen uh, videos of things as I go through, but I may have to skip stuff, especially depending how the online Mentimeter thing goes. Um, so bear with me. We will hopefully have a fun time going through. Um, but yes, I have also say I do work for Historic in my in my other half of my life. I work for Historic England. Um, so I'm just going to do this quickly give you a background to the project. Um, we're going to try and look at kind of something around what people do in post-ex analysis, um, which is relevant to sort of the work I'm doing. It is looking at um, this the, the the records that that end up in the archives, and I'm sort of trying to go back backwards to some extent from, from what's in the archive to what people have been doing to get there. I'll show you a bit of this, this software. The whole, I will say at this point, the software is entirely a prototype based uh, uh, coming out of the project, but I will then come on to the sort of the end bit, which I must make sure we get to, which is sort of talking. I've been talking with Kenneth and other people in fame about the potential for how I might take the work we've been doing as an R&D project forward perhaps <laughs> in collaboration with people from fame and elsewhere to, to, to sort of build on it and, and, and understand, I guess, feedback from you today as to where we can go. Um, so the introduction to this, it's funny not having the thing in front of me to read, is the, basically the, the project is overseeing digital practice. So I, I did some survey work pre-COVID. I started just before COVID. So I managed to visit a few people. The original idea was I would visit more people. As it turned out, I did an awful lot more zooming with people, which strangely had a silver lining because I did actually get to contact archaeologists in the field who had been given laptops because of COVID. They had to do stuff out. And, and we managed to actually contact people in some ways uh, uh, perhaps better than I would have if I'd just visited the head offices. Um, we're, we're looking into sort of things like reuse of data, in particular, very important, looking into the archives, how we make, you know, what ends up in the archive, what is actually going to be useful to us. <laughs> Why are we just archiving it, not just archiving it and not doing anything with it afterwards? And these ideas are out, uh, talk about these FAIR principles, which many people might have know, know about. Um, talk a little bit about standards and talk about research tools. Uh, and as you can see, I do have the obligatory reference to the Historic England Research Agenda at the bottom. So the question in it for me, question to you from me, is what's in it for you uh, at the moment? As I was saying, does it, having, a, having this actually going to make you any happier? Well, hopefully by the end, I'll, 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 we'll have a little bit more resolution. Um, so that's where I started was going out to various things. I visited MOLA, I visited, managed to get to PCA, I managed to get to Oxford, I managed to get to Red River in Cardiff, and then COVID hit. And I talked to other people in Yat and uh, Wessex and elsewhere. And, you know, I've talked to quite a lot of people, really helped. Well, Headland, Alex Smith at Headland's been brilliant. But the question here was like, do people, where is it, they, are there documented formal post sale X or analysis procedures, even that term post, I, I, I wince a bit when I say PX, because I always like to think analysis one day will end up being done on site. And some of it is, as I think we, we, we build our, 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 our skill and our, our processes, more and more people are actually doing some of the stuff that would have been done in analysis 50 years ago is now all done on site. Um, Questions about can you share stuff, do you share stuff, how do you share stuff, and do you have experiences of trying to use either data within your organisation or more particularly data from other people's work? Um, I also should declare I have now a fellowship of some sort, a visiting research fellowship at the University of Sheffield. 
I would have been in the archaeology department. It's in, it's in the maths and stats department. I would have had a joint fellowship with the archaeology department. Anyway, I have a PhD student who's doing Bayesian, Bayesian chronological modelling PhD with Caitlin Buck, Professor Caitlin Buck. She went to ADS because she wanted some data. And again, to try and cut short, long story short, this kind of represents, she went looking, obviously, the four sort of areas she was looking for was strat in, in, in tables, in database format, strat in matrix diagrams, and then had people phased it in some sort of chronological way, and had they done any carbon C14 dating. And you can see, basically, we came out with the really scary answer was what, something like, I mean, you can read the figures different ways, but something like 358 projects, out of 10,000 projects that said, mentioned those, one of those four things, actually finding that the number of matrix diagrams was, was very small, um, even though Julian Richard, there's a quote up there, which I think is from Julian Richards. Yes, he says that the matrix diagrams must be in the, in, in the reports, but I think <laughs> we possibly, many of you know, that if they're in the reports, they may be in as a PDF, but you cannot computationally reuse the strat unless you're prepared to type it all back in. That way madness lies. Um, actually, previous speakers have already, uh, the last speaker even mentioned how important the matrix is. So thank you for that, ABO. I don't actually really have to sell to you why matrix is important. This slide is more sort of in a way for people that don't know why matrix is important, but it emphasizes that point. Even where we find these things in the archive, they are invariably as a PDF, if you're lucky. Now, I, uh, we, will, we will unpick that a bit because there is data, the strat data, the above-below relationship, context above-below, whatever, in various formats, does appear in data tables, but it is very rarely followed through into the phasing. Um, here, let me show this. This isn't a sort of trying to, again, I say I went round to the sort of ten, at least 10 of the major units, interviewing people, trying to understand common process. My original, when I put the application in, was that uh, my original hope, <laughs> belief, whatever, was if I, act to, if I went to people, I knew they didn't necessarily have published manuals in the, in the sense that perhaps you know, people were aware there are some excavation manuals that you can go and pick up. We have one at Historic England. Mola have a very well-known one from the 90s. But I was hoping that somewhere in, in documentation, people would have a post-ex manual, and my job would be to take the manuals from the 10 different organizations and just you know, work out roughly where people were doing the same sorts of things. But with the exception of Alex Smith, nobody really was able to send me uh, anything very up to date. And what I'm kind of trying to show in this. I'm not trying to make you read all the details. Sorry about you know, the, the, don't, it. Just read the, the, the overview of this is, I ended up with this sense of archaeology being the river, and there were these two river banks. If I talked, like the projects on ADS, most of the project, 90% of the projects on ADS are what I would call, where is it, research or state-funded projects where they got right through to the end because they had the funding that allowed them to get through the publication and the archive. The upper, the upper channel here is what you guys will probably, whether, you, whether you'll, you'll accept this, but I, I put CRM as well, because I presented this recently at the SAA in, in Chicago. So the cultural resource management, whatever, commercial archeology, span that big diamond I think you'll recognize is that point where we often do the field work and you get to the, you've got the money to do the field work, I mean, the first presentation is all that is crucial to this as well. And then you might, you know, you might deliver the report on Oasis into an archive, I sort of archived at least version. But whether you actually have the money to then follow through the publication is critical. And so whether the data that is the result of the analysis and the phasing, particularly, crucially, the phasing and the chronology stuff and all the dating evidence that comes from specialists, isn't get into the archive in, in many cases. So just to sort of reiterate that, I'm, I'm making this point that the data, there is data that you could say archive when you come off site, then there might be data that you would want to put into the archive when you've analyzed it, then there may be data that's published, 
And then you've got data that goes into the other. And I put DMP as data management plan there. I promise my Duncan is here. <laughs> because I think it's important that if we're talking about things like data management plans, people should review their data management plans at key points. Because as may be the case, what you said you were going to have to do with the data when you first went on site, if you have found some unexpected stratigraphy, uh, unexpected finds, a waterlogged well with a whole load of stuff that needs carefully conserving, you will need to update what you're going to do with that data as you, before you get to the end. And that will change what you put. And crucially, where the next person starts the site next door, assuming you're in an urban context at least, or it is a site. Your da the data management plan should be a key tool in actually letting them understand what's in that data set that may be of use to them, if nothing else, where the bloody trenches were so they can find out where, <laughs> where to go next. Um, and I, just to reiterate, I see it more as a research cycle. So although I've written that as a linear thing, there's a research thing. I'm going to whiz through this. It's only one from Headlands in here, aren't they? Hats off, kudos, kudos to Alex Smith, because this is what I found, uh, the closest I could find to a sort of how you do it by numbers. And the crucial thing I'm going to get to the end, I'm going fast because I know I'm not going to get to the end of the, all my slides. I haven't done, we haven't done land use. In the, in the R&D stuff I'm going to show you, I made the decision that based what we've done is, is very much follow Harris Matrix's approach. Harris Matrix is don't use land use. There's nothing wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't do land use, you, but you can do it as a next step, I would argue, after phasing. And, you know, and, and there, there, are, there may be feedback on, on people who want to incorporate it into tools, and that's the kind of dialogue I want to have going forward. This is how Harris did it. So you look at Harris's publications. The old, you know, the old school what is like, yeah, you, you got the certificate on site, you analysed it, wrote the report, published it, put it in the archive. But I would argue things have changed now. And we, you know, a lot of you are out there doing GIS, SFM type recording. And I'm really interested in how that has altered what's ending up in the, you know, in terms of the stratigraphic record, I think it has a crucial makes a crucial difference to how people put their, their um, strat records together or, or, or publish them, um, and let alone if you're going to do Bayesian chronological modelling. So I've just done a very simple here. Apologies if people feel they're not on there, they should be on there or in the wrong place even. I guess it's okay. But I'm trying to make this point on the left about the funding source. Again, this kind of two banks of the river that we tended to find that what you, what you get in the archive is very dependent on how it was funded, as well as the methodological approaches. There is this tension between do you see your stratigraphy as single context planning or feature planning, you know, Harris v. Carver type arguments. Oh, I missed one. Can I go back? I am not going to have enough time for this. BIM. BIM's going to be important too in quantity surveying terms. I'm very interested in picking up where the bottom is. Do they track the, how do you track the bottom? Um, so at this point, anything could happen in the next half hour in true Stingray fashion. Are people up for going to this web address that says you type menti.com into a web browser and it should give you something where you stick a password in? I think what I'm going to do is not try and show you the results. If you bear with me, I will put the results up maybe at tea break. And depending on, and Doug promised he would go around and help people, but I cannot see that we've got time to do this. The questions are slightly different. When you see, if you get there on the web form, I'm not even, I, I, shall I try and switch the, no. Where's the tab? I can't even get out. Okay, so the numbers, that was bad planning, wasn't it? 24952996. I'll say it again. 24952996. And of course, the other fatal error is you'll all now be staring at your phones and not listening to a word I say if I carry on. But I will carry on. 
we'll get nowhere. So credit here, I'm just crediting my colleague Kerry Binding at the University of South Wales, who's really the, 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 the software guru, the, the, the wizard, I always say, the wizard in Wales who's, who's done the software work. So as I say, it's a prototype. This, this is not trying to sell you a piece of software. I am not in the software business. What I really want to discuss and understand, say today, is how do we make archaeological software sustainable? My experience is I've worked, you know, I'd seen what the Merle Herzog did 30 years ago with the Bond Bass Matrix, Win Matrix thing, Stratify, Arced, John Late's done some brilliant work at LP. But how do you keep this stuff alive? Or, you know, when the next version of some super browser tool comes along, we don't have the money and resources. And I think there's a real opportunity for you for a right group of people to come together and say, these are key tools that we need to do our jobs. Maybe it would help if we put something up online and we all shared the cost a bit. A, I think there's a business case for doing that. You can tell me, I don't know, you might say there isn't, or you'd have to, we'll have to work it out. And I think that's the project that we want to try and look at next, is, is what's a good business model for doing that? What are the key bits of software you might want? And then, you know, and then there's questions about how you fund that. But for me, the real crucial win at the end of that is that if people are using the same sort of tools, they're putting the data into this, you end up with an archive that is much more consistent and you can do stuff across the different sites because you've got data in, in similar structure. It's not, even, it's not even about, I wouldn't say format, you know, it's not as crisp as that. You can use different terms, you can use stuff as long as you point and tell us why you've pointed to that thing and called it what you've called it. So there's documentation, there's stuff on the web. If people are really interested, come and talk to me as well off, after this, and I can point you at stuff. We used some dummy data, but in the end, I took data, I went to the ADS archive, and I'm going to say this, we found one site which was a crossrail site, that I could actually, that actually had the data, it had data from Stratify that I could reuse, it had examples of matrices and it had everything in phasing all the way through. That was one cross, there's two. There was one that had deep strat from Liverpool Street, which is now bizarrely on the Elizabeth line. And I, I actually traveled on it only a week ago. Question there was, do people ever put more than 5,000 contexts into, into stratigraphic software? The experience at MOLA, when I talked to the people that had done the XSM10 site, Serena Ranieri and Al Telgo said, basically Serena split it in two. So she put the post-med cemetery into one block because there were lots of contexts, and then they put the pre-post-med, you know, the medieval Roman, early pre-Roman, because it was easier to manage. So even then, in the ar archive, we had two separate matrices, which is why there are some funny things which we've got. Just trying to give you some sense of what it does. It does stuff like import, export, you know, key, key requirements. I don't really want to try and inflict all this on you, but obviously trying to do things like phasing, phasing by period, typical things, what kind of other things people might do, searching, Group matrices, we've done group. I mean, I will admit we followed a pretty basic molar single context type approach. Doesn't mean you couldn't do other things, but we had, within the scope of the research project, we had to do what we could do. We've done, I've, I'm gonna show you some of the stuff that I really, why I did it with the Bayesians in mind is that, I'll get on to that, but I'm just flagging it here. There's a whole load of temporal checking. So the point around this tool is it allows people to check not just the strat, not just does my diagram look really nice. It's actually allowing you to, what you do with the matrix is, is use it to actually understand the chronology and the correlation. So when you do, I do this all the time, you slide bits of the matrix up and down because you think things are roughly contemporary because of the dating. That's what you need to be able to check as you go through. And I've had discussions with Edward Harris. He, he, he was one of the keynotes at our SAA session last year. 
And terminology is a thing. The semantics of this, I'm not going to try and get into it again. But looking at what he, you know, you can, you can call a phase or a period various terminologies. As long as we understand the reasoning behind the term you use, we can join the data up. But we, again, need to know that. You know, people talk about metadata. It's that kind of metadata, paradata thing. Um, is that running? I can't even see. It should do something, but if it doesn't, did it do anything? It was doing that. Sorry, I can't see. Right. Has it gone back again? Is that running? Is that moving? No. It's not moving. Oh, well. We'll move on. The point, the point of that slide is that we've used linked data controlled terminologies. Why doesn't it run? That's annoying. There's various things online that allow us to plug things in. I, I will, how long have I got? Not long. <laughs> ah, yeah, I will, I will do that, that's good. Okay, it looks like these animations aren't gonna run anyway, so perhaps, I'm wondering, ugh, can I move? Is anything moving? Oh, that one's moving, isn't it? Yes, right. Usually I run it so that I don't try and do it all online, but this is up online, but it's just going through and saying, you know, in this case, just in examples of how we're pulling in information from the web in control, there are some control vocabularies built into this so that when you talk about a period, you don't just type in late, late Bronze Age and spell it wrong. You know, you pull all that down from an online reference system and, and everybody then points at that and they just include the same reference in there in all the data sets. Obviously dating is, is key for the, the partnership with, the, with the, the, base, the chronological modeling. So we're, as I say, I took, I took, I cherry picked data out of XSM 10. I basically sort of amusing is that one of the things we found useful as I went through was li literally just to color in which contexts even have dating in, so that when you're all looking at the matrix, understanding that it's probably more significant if you're trying to correlate something that's got data. There's no point worrying about correlating two things that don't actually have any dating evidence. It isn't really significant. Um, discuss, I don't know. We're doing some validation checks. So this one just shows that these are, base, again, basic things. We think, you know, you want to make sure all your Con, all your groups ha they have a context in, all the subgroups have the same context that the groups, you know, if you called phases, they, 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 they've got the right data in. You can see, I mean, we're, we're, this, is not, this is not prescriptive, it's not saying the red ones won't work, they're saying, oh, there's something here that might be worth checking, or the orange, you know, the, the amber ones aren't, aren't wrong, but you might want to check because the dating isn't necessarily well, in this case, it's saying like that there's something there, there's a subgroup that's, that's not in a, in a phase, and, um, and I went and checked it. Uh, the last one, I will, I will try and dwell on this a little bit. So this goes back to research I did about 10 years ago, AHRC funded with colleagues at Salvo. It's building on this international standard called CDOC-CRM, but the chat... In the 1984, a chap called J.F. Allen highlighted the fact that there are three there are these different temporal operators. Now, what we do in archaeology and stratigraphy is we use these three, basically, before, after. We may say above, below, but effectively, chronologically, before, after, and equals. The equals is a funny one as well. But the point here, really, is that there are the, at least 10 others. Bugger. Sorry. Shouldn't swear in public, should I? There are 10 others, and what I've been doing with this research is taking the archive data that Mola put in, and by not adding anything, just by looking at the dating and the data, we have surfaced these other relationships. Now, they are, they are relationships that the archaeologists, when you fiddle with the matrix, you are effectively saying some of this stuff overlaps. Or when you put something in a phase, you're effectively saying it falls with, where, what is it? Contained, over, yeah. It's during, so it's during the phase. The phase contains these various contexts. 
And that's a temporal thing. You know, that's what we're doing. You put date boundaries on it, and that's what the Bayesians use. They do that. They use those things when they take phase in as well. So to try and get through, this is just modeling that we did. This is what we did at, at Center for in Fort Cum. I did this project 15 years ago called Revelation, where we were trying to build an information system. They ended up with interests, but we modeled the whole thing and we did this and showed these temporal operators. And now I've put that into practice. It's taken a while. And we've written it into the international, the ISO standard that is CDOC, CRM. And it allows us to start doing some of this semantic modeling and semantic searching across the data. And it's data, not, you may ask, why would I do that? If, it, if yes, if you've all got your data in one Oracle database, you can do everything you want to do it in your own system. It's when you get to the, if you're someone who comes to the archive and you're trying to join up sites in London that were dug, some by Mola, some by Wessex, some by Oxford, some by PCA, yeah, using all different software, different recording, I wouldn't say me you know, method, but you know, they've, they've labeled their data fields differently. It becomes a lot harder to join that stuff up. And that's what this sort of technology allows you to do. Again, just to explicitly show you in an example of a matrix ripped out of ADS, I can do it because it's Jim Leary's from Silbury Hill. That's in an Excel spreadsheet. I've stuck those labels in, but it's just to show you kind of again, those extra where meets in time. What we're saying there is you put those phase boundaries in, you're basically saying the phase below meets in time with the phase above. Now I know it doesn't always do it that way and people don't always do it that way, but if they do, it would be nice to know and record it that way. Is this one moving? Yeah. I will let this run. How long have I got now? Plenty of minutes. That's fantastic. I should, I can go. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're showing, really, up here somewhere, it says six, you can't see it, 600 out, six, there's 600 addition, um, relationships in there, of which we've pulled out the 131, which roughly correspond to where something like a, a context has a relationship, a stratigraphic relationship, and in this case, the orange one, the orange one is, is kind of highlighted because the dating comes up with the date of the one on the left, as equal to the date range of the one on the right, whereas the strat says they're above. Now, you can understand why that happens, because the date range is here. The pottery specialist gave it a fairly wide date range of, what is it, 120 to 250. It happens all the time. But it may be that there are some others where this is more significant. And I, I think the next one, I'll be honest, because I didn't find lots of data in the archive, I had to seed these examples with further data now. So now, what we're doing in that bottom section is showing where the red ones are. I put in something like a coin that contradicted. This is to test the software. It's a test the, set, the temporal reasoning that we've built in to make sure that it does pick out where there are conflict. You know, just things worth checking again. And this is, in, this is in archive. The point of trying to do this is not to go and check someone's archive and say, you've got that wrong, you silly person. It's to produce a tool that enables someone while they're doing it to get it as, as good as they can, really. And that's, again, a dialogue around what, you know, you can fiddle with this stuff over and over again, but we're trying to just sort of understand what requirements might be that are common requirements that we could then build something that actually kind of lasts for a bit longer than 10 years or at least is useful to people. I think that one's done. It's made, it's put the date in. Or we could just go back to doing Bayesian analysis the good old way and get Alex Bayliss to just lie on your floor. And that's Alex Bayliss lying on the floor in the site at Chattel Hewitt. Lovely side. Th thanks to my, my my colleague on the project is Dr. James Taylor at York. Just he's, he's over there now. <laughs> but he, he was the site director at Chattel Hewitt. And they've, they've redone their stuff quite a lot because of hiccups through not having data that they thought they had in quite the same place that Alex said it should have been, if you know what I mean. So 
a Bayesian chronological model is the latest method. But would make, having one make you happier? I don't know. I don't even know how often you guys would be using Bayesian analysis. But even if you don't, I would argue there is some value in having a more consistent digital record and an archive of your relationships and stratigraphy. The, 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 the matrix data, as, you know, as Amy said, is quite important and it, could, it should be reusable or at least you know, understandable and findable and ideally reusable if it's useful. Um, and I'm saying, you know, basically, I'm not, I'm not arguing for a lot of new stuff. This is stuff that Harris has done, you know, did in, in the 80s, but, we, but we're not very consistent in how we, oh, something's died. What? Why is that? I pressed something wrong. How odd. I need help. Nothing like things going wrong. Uh, how do I get to the thing? Here. <laughs> Here's where I go. Right, I'll go resort, resort to manual. Right, for some reason. Um, yeah, I, some of the work I'm going to be doing is talking with Ed Harris. Ed Harris, when he spoke to me, was, was talking about need for an international convention on stratigraphic records. I, I'm not sure about that, but one of the things I am interested in, which Kenneth spotted last time I put it on, is what I've called the Jinji boundary, is the boundary between... It's a, it's a word derived from Chinese, as I understand it, and Jin is the human bit... And G, oh, I'll get it the wrong way around so somebody will correct me. G is the natural. So like when we, when we dig sites, we talk about, we stop. Now in MOLA, in, in Exit, they will put NFE. If, and that there is a difference, as you'll know, well know, between no further excavation and am I actually at natural. And one of these I'm really interested in is whether we can pull stuff out of the British Geological Survey that tells us where the top of natural ought to be um, but that's for another day. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> yes. And I'm just going to hit the drum for data management plans. As I say, I think there's a value. We have to decide whether they're valuable. I have another survey. I'm not going to try it, I think. I think I'm going to skip that because we don't have time. And I want to get on to the actual stuff I want to put up, which is... Proposed object. So this this idea is that I'm going to put in for another bit of funding to the AHRC. They have this thing called a follow-on funding grant, which, frankly, is not very much. But it's 100k for a year. I have to be the lead on that because I because it follows on. It's supposed to follow on from the pro, from the leadership fellowship I've already got. And I ha and it. But they, and it specifically is not about me doing the, more of the same research. It's about me working in partnership with a business partner, business partner, to do something that is a kind of offshoot. So it's better described as offshoot funding, I would say, than follow on to do something different. So I'm going to put in the idea that we might do a little pilot project to even un just investigate if there is scope to put up an online tool that might be supported by a consortium of different organisations, contractors, whatever, to sustain that software and make it do what people actually want it to do for the cost benefit of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know how much, really, people need to use stratigraphic matrices tools and it depends on the site, doesn't it? I've said that, you know, if it's a complex, deep urban strat, yes. If it's three mucky trenches with top, middle, nothing at the bottom, you may not need to build very many matrices. But I think having sort of, con this is where the international convention comes in, the idea that we, it sort of comes up with some of what Mike was saying, that, that we need to be quite a bit more open about when we, we need some of these things and when we don't. So I'm putting together some recommendations. I'm sharing these with Kenneth. Um, but the idea would be to try and perhaps... What I've also highlighted in the project 
is there doesn't seem to be a handbook. We have all these handbooks when you go out on site, but where is the handbook, I don't know about Amy, where is the handbook for post-excavation? And maybe having some, there are things, like I've got there a little bit of that thing in the middle is something Steve Roskins put up 20 years ago through interpreting stratigraphy, which was the back end of the molar. And Louise Fowler sent me that, because that's what they're still using. Uh, what is that? That's what I've already just said, I think. And that's something I also say. I'm working with Matt Edgeworth on this um, where is the bottom stuff, because I think it's very relevant in terms of where we're going with the Anthropocene. Uh, and that is what Algio said about this as well. So I'm not completely talking off the top of my head. And I think that actually is possibly the slide I should end on because I've got a load of references, but let's leave that up and I'll stop and allow you to say something. Thank you. <laughs>